The goal of this video is to introduce you to the conceptual fundamentals of limits. So we're going to start with an example. Here's the Cartesian plane and we're going to drop a curtain over it and behind the scenes we've plotted a function and the question is what happens to the function value f of x as x gets closer and closer to the argument 2. So what we're going to do is draw in the curtain slowly from the outsides in all the way to the argument x equals 2 and we'll watch what happens to the function value and it sure looks like as the arguments get closer and closer to 2 the function values get closer and closer to the number 3. So what we'll say is that as x approaches 2 the limit of f of x is equal to 3 and we can use this notation to indicate the same thing. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is 3. Now an important comment here is what happens at x equals 2 has no bearing on the limiting value of f of x as x approaches 2. This is by definition. The limit has everything to do with what happens near the target argument, in this case 2, and not what happens at 2. So we've left sort of a uh, zero width curtain there at 2 to indicate that it really doesn't matter what happens. In fact, the function value could have been 1, and it would not have changed the value of the limit. Could have been a negative value, maybe the value was actually 3, and we probably wouldn't graph it like that, the graph would look sort of like that, probably. Um, maybe the function value isn't even defined at x equals 2. None of this matters for the purposes of evaluating a limit. It's all about what happens nearby. When we see this notation, the way you should read it is as the argument x gets closer and closer to the number a, the function value f of x gets closer and closer to the number l. And that's a heuristic sort of definition for what a limit is. You could play the same game by drawing the curtain just from one side. So if we drew the curtain in from the left side, in this case, the um, value of the function seems to get closer and closer to negative 3 as the argument gets closer to 2 coming from the left. So we'll say that the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left is equal to negative 3. Or we could just say the left-hand limit of f at 2 equals negative 3. And here's the notation we would use for the left-hand limit. And you'll notice this little superscript minus sign. And the way you can remember what this indicates is think of it as 2 minus a smidgen. In other words, just to the left of 2. So you're sneaking in to the argument 2 from the left. So we would say the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x is negative 3. And of course, you could pull the curtain in from the right side as well. So we'll play exactly the same game. but pulling it in from the other side. In this case, we would say the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the right is equal to 3, or the right-hand limit of f at 2 equals 3. And this would be the notation for this right-hand limit. And notice the plus superscript, and that can be thought of as 2 plus a smidgen. You're coming in from the right of 2. Now let's reveal the whole function here, pulling away the curtain entire entirely. And so we have a right-hand limit equal to 3, a left-hand limit equal to negative 3, and since these don't match up, the flat-out limit as x approaches 2 doesn't exist. These two need to match up if you're going to say the limit exists. Since it depends on which side you come in from, you can't just say that as x approaches 2, the function value gets close to any particular number. Let's look at a rather busy function. We're going to slowly draw the curtain in from the outside. And there's a lot of activity here. The graph looks pretty wacky on the right side and uh, drops dramatically on the left. And here that we, now that we've got the curtain pulled all the way into the argument 2, we can now see that the limit as x approaches 2 appears to be negative 4. Now, imagine in that process that we had frozen the uh, pulling back of the curtains at, say, a moment like this. And you'll notice that although there's very little curtain remaining. Everything we need to evaluate this limit is, is hidden to us. Put another way, everything that happened over here and over here turns out in the end to be completely irrelevant to the issue of finding the limit. So even though there's a dramatic change in the function, um, close to 2, 
um, and all sorts of crazy things are happening to the right of two. None of that matters. Everything that we need to evaluate the limit turns out to be hidden behind that little strip of curtain. It's all, it all has to do with what happens near two. And no matter how much information you already have, if you don't have it all, you need more. So maybe pulling back the curtain isn't really the best way to think about exploring a limit. Maybe what we need to do is somehow uh, apply an accordion zoom. So we're going to pull out from the line x equals 2. We'd like to pull the graph out and really examine what happens to it. So let's explore this idea with um, an example of what we might call an uncooperative function. Here's a real function that's been plotted on GeoGebra. And at this scale, when you look at the graph and the numerical data, it sure looks like the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is 1. Really looks like it. But what we're going to do is apply an accordion zoom along the x-axis and we're going to see what happens. At first, everything looks perfectly consistent with the conjecture that the limiting value as x approaches 0 is 1. But then a funny thing happens. As we continue to zoom in, the bottom seems to drop out of the function, and now you can make the case that it appears the limiting value as x approaches 0 is negative 1. But then if we zoom in further, suddenly we start coming to the opinion that perhaps this limiting value as x approaches 0 is 2. Now we really don't know what's going on. Is it the case that as we continue to zoom, we're surprised by more jumps in the apparent limit? So here's the bad news. Numerical data just is never sufficient evidence for evaluating a limit with certainty. And if you had a computer-generated graph, it might look better, but it really doesn't do the job either. It's not evidence for evaluating a limit with certainty. What's going on here is limit-like ideas, although they've been around for a long, long time, it was only relatively recently that mathematicians were able to sort out the proper definition of a limit to make the theory hang together. And this is what the technical definition of a limit looks like. It's quite imposing. If, if you want to sort of understand what it really means, it's basically the way of guaranteeing there won't be any surprises when you do an accordion zoom. The good news is, Understanding the technical definition of a limit is to learning and using calculus as knowing how an engine runs is to driving a car. If you want to drive a car, you don't really need to know how the engine runs. It would be helpful. It would inform you a lot about how you drive, but you don't need to understand how the engine runs to drive a car. Similarly, you don't need to understand that technical definition of a limit to learn and use calculus fruitfully. However, if you intend on actually truly deeply understanding calculus, you will have to confront that technical definition and sort of go through the whole development of the theory through that sort of idea. And that typically these days is left to a college course, and even then a more advanced course, probably in a, a class that would be called analysis, real analysis. More good news. The example of the uncooperative function a couple slides ago, is quite contrived. Um, the, the functions that occur naturally tend to be much more well-behaved than that, so you're not being tripped up all the time by these, these strange laboratory creations, essentially is what that was. Let's look at an example of uh, limits in action. No attempt to trip you up with any crazy hidden behavior. We'll assume all limits are as they appear. The limit as x approaches 3 of this function, as the arguments get close to 3, the function values seem to get close to 0. So we'll say that limit's 0. And, and the fact that f of 3 actually equals 0 is irrelevant for the purposes of the limit. Nice fact to observe, but it has no bearing on the limiting value. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 6. So as the arguments get close to 6, the function values get closer and closer to 4. So that limit equals 4. You might notice that f of 6 itself is equal to 1, but that, again, has no bearing on the value of the limit. And finally, let's take a look at the limit as x approaches 0. 
as the argument approaches 0, the function value seems to approach negative 1. And you'll notice that in this case, f of 0 is not even defined. 0 is not in the domain of the function. And once again, that fact is irrelevant. Limits have everything to do with the journey and not the destination. What happens when we take the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left? Looks like that function value approaches 2. And if you take the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right, the function value approaches 1. These don't match up, and so we're going to have to say that the limit as x approaches negative 3 simply does not exist.